Well, good morning to everybody out there. Wishing all of you a blessed Sabbath. Hope you all had a wonderful week. And please, dear brothers and sisters, do share your praises with us. I have a simple praise that I'd like to share with you about something that we've been doing in our church. Since the beginning of last year, since we've been in lockdown, our church began United Prayer online, both on Sac side and also DAC side. And I want to praise the Lord for the perseverance of the church members who continue to come and pray every week on a Sunday morning. On SAC, we pray at 6 a.m. On DAC, it's 7 a.m. We've been making these announcements even on our online services throughout the lockdown. And I just praise the Lord for the perseverance of many who continue to push forward with prayer. I know that the Lord is doing wonderful and amazing things. And sometimes, you know, we're praying for a lot of people, but usually the blessings come back to us and how God works is in our hearts and through our lives as well. So I just praise the Lord for this blessedness of united prayer and being able to pray together with other brothers and sisters in Christ and especially praying for our church at large as well. So friends, what are your praises? We'd love to hear from all of you. And just do share and write those praises down in the comment section below there. Would love to read all those praises. I go through every single one of them. So thank you for sharing. And we are going to get into our message for this morning. We are continuing our series on the Kings. So before we open the Word to study together, let's bow our heads for word of prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, thank you so much that we have this opportunity once again to come and study your word. Lord, we're asking for a blessing. We're asking for your Holy Spirit, that you would come and inspire our hearts, that you would lead and, and guide us, and that you would speak to us with your word and especially with your Holy Spirit. Lord, please grace us with thy presence now, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. Well, we are continuing our study on the series, The Kings, especially the kings of Judah. As you know already, as I've mentioned a few times, there are no good kings in Israel. All the good kings were in Judah. And even then, there were some that were wicked amongst them as well. They were far and few between. The king that we're looking at today is King Jotham. And King Jotham, his background is he was the son of King Uzziah who became a leper. There is another Jotham, and we've got to be careful about this. There is another Jotham that existed in the Bible, but he lived during the times of the judges before there were any kings. So you got to make sure that, you know, when you do a word search on the, his name Jotham, that you don't study the wrong person there, that you're studying actually the King Jotham who reigned over Judah. And so we're going to be studying 2 Chronicles 27 this morning. We're going to start with our first text there in 2 Chronicles 27 verses 1 and 2. The Bible says this, Jotham was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzziah did, howbeit he entered not into the temple of the Lord, and the people did yet corruptly. So we see clearly here that Jotham, he began to reign at 25 years of age, and he would reign only for 16 years. We don't know why his reign was so short, because 16 years is really not that long of a time. The Bible doesn't give any clear indication as to what happened to him. Was he killed in battle? Was he assassinated? Did he die of a disease? We have no idea. The Bible is silent about that. But yet we know that he reigned for 16 years. And the Bible says that there was good in him. He didn't burn incense like what his father did in the temple, remember? And it was only reserved for the priests. He, he was the one that was struck down with leprosy. And, you know, in the Kings, this is what is written of Jotham. Let's go to 2 Kings 15, 34. The Bible says, and he did that, speaking of Jotham, which was right in the sight of the Lord, he did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. So he was a good king. Uzziah, for the most part, 
was a good king. God blessed him tremendously financially in his armies, um, in every such way. But unfortunately, he did leave God at the end of his life. But Jotham, he picked up only the good things, at least that's what the Bible indicates, and he reigned for 16 years. However, the Bible did say that the people continued to sin. And, you know, look, there could be two reasons as to why they continued in sin. Number one, he might have been a neglectful leader. As good and holy as he was, he might have been a neglectful leader. Or secondly, it could have been that the people were so far into apostasy that it was already to the point, the tipping point, it was irreversible. That They'd gone too far, it was too late. And most likely, it was the latter. Why would I say that? Well, we read in 2 Kings 15.35, it says, How be it, the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burned incense still in the high places. So sin had been taking deep root in the nation for too long that the tide of evil was too great for him to turn it back, even as a king. And so, look, he might have been a neglectful leader, but you know what? The Bible is not clear. It doesn't say. But yet we know that he was a good king. But now, coming back to 2 Chronicles, though, let's continue reading. In 2 Chronicles 27, 3 through 5, this is what we read about Jotham. He built the high gate of the house of the Lord, and on the wall of Ophel he built much. Moreover, he built cities in the mountains of Judah, and in the forests he built castles and towers. He fought also with the king of the Ammonites and prevailed against them. And the children of Ammon gave him the same year a hundred talents of silver and ten thousand, pardon me, and ten thousand measures of wheat and ten thousand of barley. So much did the children of Ammon pay unto him both the second year and the third. So the Bible said that Jotham, he would build the house of the Lord. Maybe the temple was being neglected. It was being run down. It was being ruined. And so he would focus on worship of true God again. And not just that. The Bible said that he would build the wall of Ophel. O-P-H-E-L. What was this place, Ophel? You see, Ophel was a ridge in the hills just outside Jerusalem where it would help to fortify and defend the city. And so, yes, he focused on worship to God. He would be asking God for protection and for blessing, but also he focused on military as well. And God blessed him. He, he would prosper him. And so he built the wall out there to outside of Jerusalem to fortify the city. And it says that he would also build cities in the mountains and would also build castles and towers. So whilst he relied on God, he came back to the worship of the true God. He did his very best to prepare for war in times of peace. And so he did refocus on God, built the house of the Lord. But, you know, friends, we got to understand that God will not do for us what he's left for us ourselves to do. There was nothing wrong with, with building the walls, and, and we see many kings did that as well. There was nothing wrong with, with training more people in the army. There was nothing wrong with having the chariots and all of these things, but we have to make sure that our defense comes from God, that we don't rely fully on these physical things that we see and these physical preparations. Our dependence must always rest back on God. God will not do for us what He's left for us ourselves to do. And we can't go beyond the scope of what God has asked. I believe that even in the days of, of King David, um, that or Solomon it was rather, that God had warned not to store up more horses and chariots. Why? that the bigger our armies get sometimes, right? The more we depend upon our own strength and our own blessings. And that's what happened with his father, Uzziah, right? He got so rich that eventually his heart was turned away from God. He focused on the world rather than focusing solely on God. But Jotham, he would do his part. And when war came, he would prevail. He would prevail and be victorious against 
the Ammonites. And as a result, and because of that, the Ammonites would give him 100 talents of silver, 10,000 measures of wheat, and 10,000 measures of barley. So God really blessed him. You know, when we seek God, when we come and worship and spend time at the feet of Jesus, don't think that it's a duty that we got to be with Him and walk with Him. If not, we're going, not going to heaven. No, friends, you got to realize that our devotion to God, our walk with God, our relationship, our closeness, our connectedness with God, it only turns around and becomes a great blessing to ourselves in the end. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I'm telling you, as students, if you would focus on God, God would bless you in your studies. As professionals, if we would spend time with God, learn to walk with Him, make Him our constant companion, He would lead us. Yes, He would guide us. We shouldn't do it for the sake of blessings. Friends, we got to know what it means to love God with all our hearts. Learn to make Him our first, best, and our last in everything. And if we would choose to focus on Him, He would draw close to each and every one of us. God, He prospered Jotham. He prospered him in worship. He prospered him in building. He prospered over God's enemies. He prospered in finance. God was with him because he was with God. And of course, he probably would not have been as prosperous as his father Uzziah, who was only second to Solomon in, in wealth and fame, I guess, and glory. But nonetheless, God would be with him. Let's continue reading, shall we? In 2 Chronicles 27, verse 6, this really is the key text of Jotham's life. It says, So Jotham became mighty because he prepared his ways before the Lord his God. Friends, what was it that made Jotham to be a mighty man on this earth? It was because he prepared his ways before the Lord his God. And I just want to quickly read the rest of the chapter and the, really the story of Jotham's life because it really is uneventful. There, there really is not that much that the Bible gives us. Yes, our sermon is a little shorter this, this morning, but I pray that nonetheless, it'll be a blessing. But let's just read first here. Verse 7 to 9 of Second Chronicles 27. Now the rest of the acts of Jotham and all his wars and his ways, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. He was 25 years old when he began to reign and reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And Jotham slept with his fathers and they buried him in the city of David and Ahaz, his son, reigned in his stead. Yes, the rest of the life of Jotham was uneventful. Except for that one war that he went out at the very beginning there, we really don't see anything else that happened to him. It seems like he had a peaceful reign. He was one of the few kings that started on a good note, at least it seems, and ended on a good note as well. And so look, what I want to focus on this morning though, is the key text that we read earlier, just before this, in 2 Chronicles 27 verse 6. Jotham, he became mighty. Why? What was the reason for his might? Because he prepared his ways before the Lord his God. Friends, what does it mean to prepare our ways before the Lord our God? What does that mean? How can we be mighty men and women for God today? How can we prepare our ways? Well, you see that word prepared there, it suggests that he was making something ready. In the concordance, it gives us idea that he was establishing something so as to fix it in place. The ESV says he ordered his ways before the Lord his God. And the NIV says he walked steadfastly before the Lord his God. And so as we look at this word, prepared his ways before the Lord his God, it's important to, to note that it's not just some sort of little preparation here, but there's physical preparation. There's walking after God. There's ordering our steps and setting things in order. Jotham, he planned, he thought, he considered all these things, and this, he knew, would lead him, not just to God, but to the prosperity of the nation as well. So look, there are two dynamics that are suggested by this word prepare. 
Okay, first, it gives us thought of personal preparation of one's actions that's intentional, it's thought out, and it's arranged in advance. That's what preparation is, right? You're thinking ahead. You're thinking thoroughly. You're thinking in advance. It's intentional thought. So look, the course of Jotham's life, friends, it was not accidental. Do you see that? Maybe he looked at his dad and what happened to him and how he became a leper and he wasn't able to touch his dad or be near his dad the rest of his life, right? And so he began to prepare. He began to pray. He began to think how he would rule as the next king. He made sure he wouldn't go into the temple of the Lord like his father did to make sure that his decisions were clear and cut and according to God's will. His life was much of forethought. He prepared. Do you see that? And you know, friends, I think we can look back at our own families and even then see in our parents the things that we like and also the things that we don't like so much that we would like to change in our own lives. And you know, there are instances where mistakes are just repeated over and over again. We're born with the same inherited tendencies to sin, but you know, friends, we can overcome it. Sin can be overcome. We don't have to keep repeating the same mistakes of our parents all the time. But if we are to change, if we are to grow beyond the struggles of our parents, it's going to require preparation. It's going to require intentional forethought, thinking in advance, arranging things in advance. Friends, it requires mental preparation spiritual preparation, and even physical preparation. Friends, to do something like this, it requires effort. It will require effort, yes. We're going to sit there and meditate and think and, and pray and ask God for wisdom and, and then making sure that our plans align with God's plans. So, so the first thing that we see here when it comes to how Jotham prepared his ways before the Lord, personal preparation of one's actions that's intentional, thought out, and arranged in advance. But secondly, it suggests that there were convictions that drove those actions that were solidly established and then permanently fixed in his heart. Something that could not be shaken away, something that even though circumstances changed, he himself would not be unfaithful. You see that? So when it comes to preparation, It comes to this point where we are fixing a thought or idea or a desire in our hearts. Yes, he should have gone a little bit further. He could have done a bit more for God, but he was faithful nonetheless. That's what the Bible says. But yes, he could have done more in removing the high places out of of, um, Israel and, uh, pardon me, in Judah, right? Where people were still burning and sacrificing to false gods. But he did what he could. At least that's what the Bible seems to indicate. We got to make sure that we are fixed in our purpose. We got to make sure that we are intentional about what we do and the decisions that we make are firm and decided. And we see such instances like this in the Bible as well. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Oh, a famous passage, right? But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So Daniel, he purposed in his heart. He made the decision before he came to the event itself. He made a firm commitment to the Lord. You see, we got to have this sort of purpose. We got to have these sort of preparations before we even go forward for each and every day. Friends, faithfulness does not come by accident, especially if all we've known before is laziness or unfaithfulness or, you know, all all those things that, that cause us not to be the man or woman that God wants us to be. If we want change, we got to prepare. Prepare our thoughts, our heart, our mind, and even our actions. Prepare a schedule. Make sure that we follow and walk according to God's will and His way. We see another instance of a person in the life of Joseph. 
Look at what the pen of inspiration says about Joseph. Patriots and prophets, and we're going to read two paragraphs here, 2.13, paragraph 3 to 2.14. Then his thoughts, speaking of Joseph, turned to his father's God. In his childhood, he had been taught to love and fear him. Often in his father's tent, he had listened to the story of the vision that Jacob saw as he fled from his home, an exile and a fugitive. He had been told of the Lord's promises to Jacob and how they had been fulfilled, how in the hour of need, the angels of God had come to instruct, comfort and protect him. And he learned of the love of God in providing for, um, for men a redeemer. Now all these precious lessons came vividly before him. Joseph believed that the God of his fathers would be his God. And he then and there gave himself fully to the Lord. And he prayed that the keeper of Israel would be with him in the land of his exile. His soul thrilled with a high resolve. You see that? The high determination to prove himself true to God under all circumstances to act as became a subject of the kingdom of heaven. He would serve the Lord with undivided heart and, perf and he would meet the trials of his lot with fortitude and perform every duty with fidelity. One day's experience had been the turning point in Joseph's life. Its terrible calamity had transformed him from a petted child to a man, thoughtful, courageous, and self-possessed. You know, when Joseph was sold as a slave by his brothers to Egypt, he cried for a little while. But after that, he made a firm decision. He prepared. Even as he was sitting there in that little cell or, or tie, with hands tied and having to walk behind a train of camels or whatever it was, he determined that he was going to be faithful no matter what. Friends, we got to make decisions before we come to the act itself. We have to make preparation. We've got to prepare our ways, as Jotham did, before the Lord. If not, friends, more often than not, we will fail. But here's the thing, friends. What did he actually prepare? What did Jotham actually prepare? It says he prepared his ways. And the word ways means course of life or mode of action, conversation, journey. Okay? So he wasn't just saying, oh, okay, I'm going to do it. But he was actually mapping out his course of life, what he was going to do, what he was going to say, how he was going to do it. There was a lot of preparation that was going on. Do you see that? And so it wasn't just, I'm just making a decision and that's it. No, it was much more than that. You know, I want to look at a different king real quickly. King Jehoshaphat, he was a good king. And it says here in 2 Chronicles 19 verse 3, look at this. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. King Jehoshaphat prepared his heart to seek God. But here the matter is taken out of the realm of the heart, you see. And, and not just the heart alone, our, our minds and our thoughts, but it's brought into the actions, brought into the ways, uh, our, our, you, you know, the physical realm. And Jotham, he prepared his ways. Yes, we need to have a mental preparation, but we mustn't just stop there. It's one thing to prepare our hearts. It's quite another to prepare our ways as well. It requires careful planning. Already, preparing a heart requires careful planning, but putting into action these things, it requires a lot of mental forethought about the actions of each day. You know, friends, it's important to plan your day. Of course, there are some that just go to the office and you have the work that's set out there before you, right? But how about the time before that? How about the time before you go to school or before you go to the office? Do you pre prepare your meals? Do you plan the time you get up? Do you plan that you're going to give yourself enough time to, to spend time with God? Do you then plan really the time you should go to bed? Do you prepare your schedule, plan your schedule? All these things are important. You need to plan the time you exercise as well. Many of us, we don't give that, that plan, put that plan into our hearts and minds or into our schedules. It never happens. Friends, it takes careful planning 
if you want to be successful beyond just doing the bare minimum of what you have to do at work or at school? Do you make plans to sit down and to read, to improve yourself? Friends, all these things requires careful preparation. We must prepare our ways before the Lord. To the point that if you're struggling with something bad, make sure you prepare enough time, uh, enough of your time, so that it's filled with good things, so you don't have time for bad things as well. You know, friends, I'm not saying that everything we we do has to be dedicated to the Lord. Yes, we've got to be faithful in all that we say and do, but we must still plan. It's not you have to read the Bible a whole day. You still got to plan. That's not realistic, right? Plan even the time, friends, you'll be at church and bend all the energies of your heart and mind and body to accomplish that. Prepare your ways before the Lord. It is so important. It is so important to have deliberate thoughts about our actions, our ways, and the habits of our life. Look at what the pen of inspiration says here in Gospel Worker 92, 110, paragraph 1. She says, There is much in the conduct of a minister that he can improve. And you know, let's not just look at ministers, but let's look at ourselves in general. There is much a conduct of a person that can improve. Many see and feel their lack, yet they seem to be ignorant of the influence they exert. They are conscious of their actions as they perform them, but suffer them to pass from their memory and therefore do not reform. Do you see that? So look, if you live a public life and people see it, many people see the improvements in your life that need to be made. But the question is, do you see the improvements that need to be made in your life? I've always said this. You know, it's always more humiliating and humbling and embarrassing when someone else has to tell you what you need to do to grow rather than you can reflect on it. Look at this. This is what she says, if we want to avoid that sort of embarrassment. Make, if ministers would make the actions of each day a subject of careful thought and deliberate review. You see that? Careful thought, deliberate review, with the object to become acquainted with their own habits of life. They would better know themselves by a close scrutiny of their daily life under all circumstances. They would know their own motives, the principles which actuate them. This daily review of our acts to see whether conscience approves or condemns is necessary, is essential, is absolutely needed for all. You see, this is not just ministers. For all who wish to arrive at the perfection of Christian character. So not only should we plan our ways for the day or for the week and set our schedules, but friends, we need to review the actions of the past day, whether conscience condemns or whether it approves. This will help us to adjust so we will know how to plan for the next day. There must be deliberate thought, friends, about your life. If you don't th do the thinking for yourself, people will do the thinking for you. Meaning, if you don't think about what you said or what you did, people will point it out that why you would speak this way or why you would say that. That's much more humiliating. We need to plan as best as possible our day. But friends, at the end of each day, we need to review and see how we can improve. But Jotham, he didn't just plan his life the way that he wanted, you see. Coming back to the key verse, it says what? Jotham became mighty because he prepared his ways before the Lord his God. He planned it before the Lord his God. All his plans, God was in it. He was praying about it. He was submitting it to God. He was asking God, if it's not according to your will, then change it. Oh, friends, how much of a heartache we would save ourselves if we would do that. God, if this woman is not the woman that you want me to, to, to date, you tell me, and He will, He will, if you're willing to seek counsel, if you're really willing to do His will. You see, Jotham, he sought God for the confirmation of his plans. He made sure that his plans harmonized with what God stated in His Word and according to His will. Friends, are all your plans according to God's plans? 
Have you deliberately sought God and put Him first in all these plans? In your studies, in your work, in your business, in your home, in the free time and your entertainment, in the music that you listen to, in the food that you eat, the friends that you choose to to accompany with. Is God in all of this? Can you honestly say that you have laid before God all your plans, all your desires, all your wishes, all your ambitions, everything? Are you doing it His way? One last thing from this key text. Jotham became mighty because he prepared his ways before the Lord his God. Jotham was the one that prepared his ways. He didn't rely on anyone else to do it for him. He took personal responsibility of his personal life, his spiritual life, his rulership as a king. And as good as a king as he was, Judah had gotten to the point that God's judgments were soon to fall upon the land. The northern kingdom would invade them. Also, Syria would come as well. And many times, the Assyrian kingdom would threaten to come in and conquer and to overflow into the land. God's mercy was about to run out. Unfortunately, it was too late to save the kingdom. But friends, let's not allow the tide of apostasy from the outside, from even influences within the church sometimes, to affect the way that we live for God. We got to take personal responsibility. And friends, today, that begins with intentionally planning our lives, intentionally putting God in the midst of all our plans, of all our activities, of everything. We got to make sure that we prepare our ways before God. And friends, if this past week has found God not in your plans, you've come to the short end of the stick and you realize that, oh, oh, God wasn't there. I shouldn't have been doing this. And maybe you've suffered the consequences of some of your decisions. The fact that you are here this morning, the fact that you are listening to the sermon tells me that it's not too late to change, that you can still put God in the midst of your plans. And though it might be too late sometimes to change some consequences as good as Uh, King Jotham was. It was too late to to turn Judah into the right path. But friends, we've got to be responsible for our own lives. We've got to make sure that we are walking with God, that we are faithful to Him, that we're not doing our own ways and our own thoughts. We've got to come back and tell God, we're sorry. And then, you've got to start planning out your life for this week in advance. As soon as you're done, we've got to start thinking about the things that we need to change the things that we need to implement, how we are going to get up early enough to spend time with God, how we're going to be able to spend some time throughout the day and in the evening with God as well. We got to start preparing our personal agendas and schedules. We got to start preparing our homes. We got to start preparing our finances. We got to start preparing our studies and our work that we might be a blessing to all those around us, how we can be faithful to God even in the midst of all our activities. Friends, we got a plan to do the very best that we can in this new week with God by our side. And so friends, let's not just pray and ask God to take full control and then we do nothing. Let's ask Him to come in and give us the wisdom to know how to plan for Him in this coming week, how to know we can live for Him in this new week. Friends, is that your desire? I just want to invite you to pray with me right now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, forgive us. So often we have not put you in the midst of our plans. We've not put you in the midst of our lives. We've been living life without you. Lord, please help us in this new week that we would put you first and last and best, that we would put you in the very middle of all that we say and do, that we would learn to come and submit to you first. Lord, please be with my brothers and sisters here. Lord, we see the the time approaching. We see events unfolding, showing us that you're coming so soon. Help us, Lord, with urgency. Help us to remember these lessons that we're learning, that we'll not walk away from this sermon 
and, and our lives unchanged. But Lord, maybe even some of us now as we're praying, we realize that there's something that needs to change. Please help us to that end, Lord. So guide us, fill us with your Holy Spirit and help us know how to live for you in this coming week. And so Lord, we just surrender all these things to you. Please continue to guide us, grant us your spirit, give us wisdom and lead us continually, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, thanks for spending time with us this morning. God bless each and every one of you. And let's today, no matter what day you're listening to this sermon, let's today start to plan to put God right there in the very middle of our lives. May God bless each and every one of you. Until we meet again, may God be with you and goodbye for now.